phase of matter. So your solids, your liquids, and your gases. So we're going to go into kind of a little bit of detail about what are some of the main differences between those different groups and how can you change from one group to another. So we can go ahead and jump into the notes here. Let's see which one we're going to. There it is. All right, so we are in week two of term five here at the Excel Center. So one week down, seven to go. And so your notes and stuff for today were already posted earlier. So today, the first set of notes that we go through usually is pretty short and doesn't take very much time. And so if we get to that pretty quickly, then I have a second set of notes for us to go through as well. So our main notes today have to do with states of matter, like I said, the solid versus liquid versus gas, as well as phase changes, or how one state of matter changes into a different one. All right, there we go. So states of matter and phase changes is going to be kind of the first section of class today. So when we're talking about matter, which again, matter is just a fancy science way of saying stuff. Things that are out there, particles, molecules that are out there in the universe, it is all matter. So before we actually get into the differences between solids, liquids, and gases, we first have to talk a little bit about what's happening down at like the super tiny molecular level. And we can do that with something called the kin kinetic molecular theory. So these are really big, scary sounding science words, but really kinetic just means motion or movement. Molecular means like molecule, so down at the tiny, tiny particle level. And then theory being an idea or a set set of kind of scientific facts. So you'll see this written out sometimes as KMT. And basically, all that it means, all this big fancy science term means, is that all matter, all stuff in the universe is made up of these tiny, constantly moving particles. So later on in this class, we'll talk about what those particles are and what kind of goes into making them. But for now, these tiny particles are what make up matter. And uh, KMT says that these particles are constantly moving. They're constantly in some sort of motion. The other thing that the theory says is that the kinetic energy, which is just a fun way of saying the kind of motion, the movement of these particles, increases as temperature increases. So as you get hotter, as you raise the temperature of an area, it's making those particles move faster and faster and faster. So the hotter that it gets, the faster that the particles move. So things that are hot have faster moving particles than things that are cool. But all of it is made up of these particles, and all these particles are constantly moving. So this makes sense for certain things, like air moves around a lot, right? And liquids are very mobile. But you might be thinking, Mr. Stanley, what about solids? What about something like this? water bottle right here. If I set it down on the ground, it doesn't really move at all. I don't see any movement happening in this water bottle. And that's true, those particles aren't moving very much, but they are still in motion. 
essentially they're just kind of vibrating next to each other. So they're not like moving out and in and back and forth. When you're in a solid, you're mostly sitting in the same place and you're just kind of vibrating back and forth a little bit. So speaking of solids, because solids have not very much particle movement, their particles are pretty close together, they just kind of shake a little bit, they have the lowest amount of kinetic energy. So their particles can vibrate next to each other, but they're not moving around all over the place. So to us, to our human eye, it looks like they're just sitting completely still because we can't see down to like the teeny tiny particle level with just our own eyeball. So when we look at it, we see something that is standing still, not really moving. So the two major kind of properties of solids is that they have what's called a definite shape and a definite volume. So what that means is that the shape and the size of the solid do not move. They don't move around at all. They don't change. They don't get bigger or smaller or change shape. So like my computer mouse here, if I leave it down on the ground, whoops, and don't touch it, don't do anything for it, it's going to stay there. It's not going to change its shape. It's not going to start looking like something else. And it's not going to start like getting way bigger or way smaller. Right? If you're a solid, then you are set in your shape and volume. It doesn't matter if I'm holding this mouse in my hand or I put it on my computer or I throw it over my shoulder and it lands on the floor. It's going to stay the same shape and size no matter what. So that's what we mean by definite shape and definite volume. They're staying put. They will always be the same. So like if you took this little clump of solid particles here and put it into this glass, they would stay stuck together in this cube shape, right? They're not gonna change shape just because of where you put them. And they're not gonna take up more space or less space they're pretty much set in how much space they take up and what size they are. That's what makes them solid. So solids, lowest energy, least amount of movement, very close stuck together particles. If we add in some energy, we get some more movement going in these particles, then we could have some liquid. But in a liquid, we have a little bit higher kinetic energy. So the particles are still kind of close together. They're not totally like separated, but they can still move around each other, right? They're a lot more fluid. They're a lot more able to move in their matter. So this is a lot more motion than we saw in the solid, which is why they have this higher energy. More movement, more motion, more energy. Liquids, unlike solids, do not have a definite shape, right? If I took the water in my water bottle, right now it's kind of like this tube shape, but if I just poured it straight out onto the ground, it would flatten out and just kind of cover the ground, right? Or if I put it in like a really big drinking glass, it would take the shape of that glass. So liquids don't have a set shape. They're not like solids. Instead, they have an indefinite shape, not a defined shape. So whatever container you put them in, that's the shape that a liquid will take. So the shape of the liquid changes to fit its container. Liquids do, however, have a definite volume. Right, if I poured out one cup of water from my water bottle into a measuring cup and then put it from that measuring cup into a drinking glass and then put it from that drinking glass into a pot on the stove and then took it from that pot on the stove and dumped it into the sink, it would still be one cup of water the whole time. So liquids do have a set 
volume, a set amount of space that they take up. However, they can change the shape of that volume in order to fit the container, right? If you take a big like pitcher out of the refrigerator and pour it into a glass, the liquid was probably really spread out, took up a lot more space in the pitcher, but now the glass is a little bit smaller. And so it just takes up the shape of the glass. It fills out the bottom and then starts to move up the glass. So it's always a set amount. It will be a certain amount of liquid. However much you pour out from the pitcher, that's how much will be in the glass. It will just take up the kind of bottom area of that glass here. So liquids, more energy than solids. They don't have a set shape. Their particles can move around a lot more so they can kind of flow and take up any space that they need to, but they still have a set volume, a set size. One cup of water is one cup of water, no matter what type of container that you put it in. So those are our liquids. And then finally, the highest state of matter that we are going to talk about in this class, at least, are the gases. So gases have the highest kinetic energy out of all of these three states of matter. And a gas, your particles can be totally separate from one another, and they can really easily move throughout the entire container. So one of the cool things about gases is that gases do not have a set shape or a set volume. So you can change the shape and the volume of a gas in order to fit whatever container that you put it in. And so because these particles are so spread apart and they're moving so quickly all around, their shape and volume can be constantly changing. They can be more spread out, they can be getting closer together and then spread out again. So gases do not have a set shape or a set volume. So whatever sort of container or area that you put the gas into, it will spread out to take up that entire area. So their volume can expand or contract depending on what sort of container they are in. Unlike the solids and the liquids, which have a set volume that they have to stay at. So those guys can't get bigger or smaller without changing their shape. They're kind of set at one certain volume. Gases don't have to worry about that. They can be completely spread out apart and taken up however much or however little volume that they need to. So with our gases, we have very fast motion of our particles. We have no shape and no set volume. It all depends kind of on where those gases get into. All right, so before we move along, does anybody have any questions so far about our solids, our liquids, and our gases? What makes them different? What makes them distinct from each other? Any questions about any of this stuff so far? All right, cool. Thanks, Rose. Thanks. No worries. All right, so those are sort of our basics. Our solids, lowest energy, closest particles, very set shape and volume. Our liquids, medium energy, a little bit more movement of the particles, don't have a set shape, but do have a set volume. And then finally, our gases, highest amount of energy, very fast moving particles, very spread out from each other they don't have a set shape or a set volume. They can kind of make a bigger or smaller volume depending on 
where they are. So things matter specifically does not stay as a solid liquid or a gas forever. Instead, depending on how much energy or what kind of temperature that you're at, we can change from one to the other. Some of these changes you've probably heard of before, some of them might be new, but altogether they're known as phase changes. So what we were just talking about are called either states of matter or phases of matter, kind of depending on who you're talking to. So when we change what state that we're in, we call it a phase change. So like I said, some of these you guys probably are aware of already, even if you maybe don't exactly know it. So if something melts, if something warms up and melts, what phases are we changing between? It's going from which state to which state or melting? Solid to liquid? Yep, exactly. Solid to liquid. So imagine you pull out a solid piece of ice from your fridge or your freezer, put it on your counter and just let it sit there for an hour or so. If you come back an hour later, it's going to be liquid water that is laying all over your countertop. And so melting is going from solid to liquid. What about if we go the other way? What if we take something that's liquid and we cool it down enough so that it hardens into a solid? What is that called? Uh, Frozen. Freezing. Freezing, exactly, <laughs> very good. Anthony and Emery, perfect. Freezing is the exact opposite, going from a liquid to a solid. So this is why you should never put a full can of something like Coca-Cola in your freezer, is because when liquids that have a lot of water and then freeze, that conversion causes them to expand and it'll explode the can open in your freezer. So be careful if you're ever doing that. But yeah, taking something that's liquid and cooling it down enough to where it solidifies is called freezing. So this usually happens at a certain temperature called either the melting point or the freezing point. So for water, it's zero degrees Celsius or 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you take frozen water, if you take ice, and put it somewhere that is above zero degrees Celsius, it'll start to melt. Similarly, if you take liquid water and you put it somewhere that's below zero degrees Celsius, it'll start to freeze. So it depends on kind of which direction you're going in, but there's always a certain temperature at which point a piece of matter will start to either freeze or melt, depending on which phases that you're changing between. All right, so good job so far. If we take something solid and heat it up to liquid, we're melting it. If we take something liquid and cool it down to solid, we are freezing it. We can also take something up to an even higher temperature. In kind of everyday use, we call it boiling, but in more scientific terminology, it's called vaporization. So this is where we go from liquid to gas. So we heat up the liquid, we give the liquid enough energy, enough motion to where it turns into a gas. So you put some water on the stove, you crank up the heat, and eventually you see all the bubbles coming up and all of the water vapor coming up out of your pot. That water vapor is water in gas form. So this happens at something called the boiling point, the temperature at which the liquid will start boiling and turning to a gas. And it's happening pretty rapidly. So we're constantly turning liquid into a gas. So this is one way that we can go from liquid to gas, but there is another way. Imagine, for example, that Yesterday, it rained a whole lot, and you went out in the evening, and you saw a whole bunch of big puddles 
around your neighborhood or in your front yard. And then today in the afternoon, you walk outside and all the puddles are gone. All the water that was sitting there has disappeared. It hasn't disappeared because it all boiled away because if it was at water boiling temperature outside, uh, we would all be dead, which is not great. But instead we had evaporation. So evaporation is another way to go from liquid to gas. This is what causes puddles to disappear when it's nice and warm and dry outside. This is what allows for like you, if you're doing any drying, like if you're drying clothes outside in the wind, evaporation is what will take the moisture away from your clothes and go turn it into gas. So we're still going from liquid to gas, but it happens much more slowly. Boiling is like instantaneous, constantly turning into gas. Evaporation is a much slower, kind of long drawn out process. So it's still the same change, but over a much longer period of time. So finally, we have to go in the other direction, right? We have to, we can also cool down this gas and turn it into a liquid. So we call that condensation, gas to liquid. So condensation is actually what produces clouds and rain. So there's lots and lots of water vapor up in our atmosphere. And when some of that water vapor cools down and starts to kind of stick together, it forms clouds. So clouds are essentially just big piles of really thick water vapor. Eventually, if you get enough clouds together at a cool temperature, all the water vapor in there starts to condense and turn into liquid water. Liquid water is heavier than water vapor, so it falls down out of the air as little droplets that we call rain. So condensation is cooling down a gas in order to turn it into a liquid. So those are kind of the most common phase changes, the ones that you guys probably have experienced throughout your lifetime, um, even though you may not have realized it or known that that's what it was called. But there is another set of phase changes that are a little bit more rare. They're not quite as common, but in my opinion, they're just as, if not more, cooler. So the first one is called sublimation. And sublimation is when you skip over the liquid phase entirely and go directly from a solid to a gas. So this usually happens because you have a solid that is really, really, really cold and you put it somewhere that is much warmer than the solid. Essentially the solid gets so hot that instead of melting and turning to a liquid, it skips that point totally and starts just turning straight into gas. So dry ice is a perfect example of sublimation. I don't know if you guys have ever gotten dry ice from the store before or like seen it at the party. It's the one where when you pop the top open on like the special cooler that it comes in, you see all of this, it looks almost like mist or fog starts rolling out. So dry ice is really cool because it is frozen carbon dioxide gas. So the people that make it cool down carbon dioxide past its freezing point, which turns it into a solid. So it's super duper cold. And then when that solid carbon dioxide is exposed to the atmosphere, like a normal 70, 80 degree day, the ice is so cold and the air is relatively so warm that it immediately just starts coming off of the block as a gas. So we skip the liquid step entirely and heat up so hot that we become a gas. Uh, yeah, Anthony, go for it. So, um, so basically, so dry ice can be a liquid if you don't heat it up as fast. 
Mm -hmm. So if you put it somewhere that was really cold, but warmer than the freezing point, then you could get it to become a liquid. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. It'd have to be like a really, because I think the freezing point of dry ice is like negative 100 something degrees. And so it'd have to be somewhere that was really cold in order for to kind of control that transition between being a solid and being a liquid without turning to the gas phase. But yeah, theoretically, if you're able to put it somewhere in that liquid zone of temperature, then it would melt without turning into a gas. Good question. So yeah, it's called dry ice because for the most part, it doesn't get wet. It skips that liquid wet stage entirely and immediately starts to turn into a gas. And that's what all that cool kind of mist and smoke and fogginess is coming out of it. It's just the gas coming directly off of the dry ice. We can also go in the reverse of this, which is how dry ice is made in the first place through a process called deposition. So deposition is just the opposite of this. It's where you take a gas and you cool it down really, really quickly and it turns into a solid. So like I said, this is how you make the dry ice. You take some carbon dioxide gas, put it somewhere that's extremely cold and it immediately starts to form a solid. So sublimation and deposition, not as commonly seen during your kind of everyday life as the other ones, but still possible to do in the right conditions. So we have what I think is a handy dandy little chart here that kind of shows all this stuff going on together. So we have our solid material that if you warm it up enough, it'll melt and turn into a liquid, right? No set shape, still the same volume, a little bit more motion in your particles. If you warm up the liquid enough, either it evaporates or it starts to boil and vaporize, it turns into a gas. Much faster particles, way more spread out, constantly changing shape and volume. If you cool that gas down, you can condense it into a liquid. And then if you cool the liquid down even further, it'll freeze and turn into a solid. So if you take that solid and heat it up really, really hot, really, really quickly, it will sublimate or go through sublimation and turn into a gas. And if you take that gas, cool it down extremely quickly, it will go through deposition and turn directly into a solid, kind of skipping out that liquid step. So those are our major phase changes that can, we can go through in order to turn from a solid to a liquid to a gas or back the other way. Um, again, it happens all the time in the world around us, and it all depends on sort of the temperature that your substance is at. So there's a certain temperature where solid substances will melt into liquids and certain temperatures where liquids will freeze and turn into solids. And the same thing for going from liquid and gas. At some point, the liquid will hit the boiling point and start turning into a gas. And if you cool down the gas enough, it'll hit that kind of condensation point and start turning into a liquid. All right. Does anybody have any questions so far about the different phases, the different phase changes, or what it's called when we kind of go between each one? All right. Sounds like everybody is okay with this so far. 
Um, so that for these phase changes, really the main thing that you just need to know is what are the names of them? And for each one, what phases are you going between? From this one to this one, and what is it called, pretty much? All right, so that was sort of the first part of the notes that I wanted to take you guys through. Um, as expected, we have plenty of time left for our second part. So the next thing that I want to show you guys kind of puts together all of these ideas of solids, liquids, and gases, and how they change from one into another, and puts it into this larger overall kind of graph called a heating curve. So definitely pay attention and ask questions if you have them while we're going through this, because um, probably early on in the semester, this is the first thing that we come to where I explain it a whole lot of times, but then people are still a little bit confused when they get to the homework and stuff later on. And so I'll take you step by step through what each part of the heating curve means. Um, but please, if you ever get a little bit confused or not sure exactly what I'm pointing out, feel free to stop me and have me go over something again. So a heating curve is also sometimes called a phase change curve or a phase change diagram or a heating diagram. Uh, it just kind of depends on the scientist you're talking to. Uh, but they all refer to the same thing. It's this general graph showing the temperature of an object as you heat it up over time. So the conceit of a heating curve is like you have a thermometer stuck into some object. You put it on like a heating pad or like a stove or something like that and slowly increase the temperature over time and then measure at different intervals what is the temperature of your object. So you might expect that if you're constantly adding heat, then the temperature is just going to be a straight line from somewhere really cold to somewhere really hot. But as we'll see, that's not exactly the case. And I'll make sure to talk a whole lot about why it is that instead of getting a nice straight line that you might expect, we instead get a kind of zigzag stair step looking line. But before we get into it, the first thing that I kind of want to talk about when it comes to heating curves is this idea of kinetic energy. So remember earlier I was saying how kinetic means like motion or movement, essentially. So kinetic energy refers to how fast the particles are moving in your matter. And the cool thing about kinetic energy is that it is directly related to temperature. So as you add heat to an object, it causes the temperature to go up. And the temperature is going up because you have this faster movement of your particles, meaning that you have more kinetic energy. So as the heat goes in, the particles move faster and faster and faster, and that's what causes the temperature to go up. Your thermometer is basically just reading how fast are these particles moving and putting a number on it in either Fahrenheit or Celsius. So kinetic energy is sort of the first thing that we're going to look at on the heating curve where we're changing that kinetic energy. And it's in the areas where the temperature is increasing. So we're staying as one state, we're staying as a solid or a liquid or a gas. We're just getting hotter. We're getting more faster particles. So here's sort of what a basic heating curve looks like. Again, it's not just one straight line from a cold temperature up to a hot temperature. Instead, it follows this sort of zigzag pattern where we have some areas where the heating curve is going up, like this one, and this one, 
and this little nub over here. And we have some areas where the heating curve is staying flat, like this one and this one down here. So the way a heating curve is set up, we have the time that's passed by on the bottom here and the temperature of our object on the side. Excuse me. So in this case, this is a heating curve for water right here. So we're starting off with a big block of ice that's at negative 20 degrees Celsius. And we're ending up with some water vapor that's above 100 degrees Celsius. So wherever you see an area on your heating curve where the temperature is going up, the temperature is increasing, we're going up on our graph. That's an area where you're set as one of your states of matter in this line going up right here, we are a solid. And this line going up here, we're a liquid. And in this line over here, we are a gas. So we're staying as a set state, but our temperature and therefore our kinetic energy of our particles is going up. So the Ke just refers to kinetic energy. So over here, we're a solid that's getting warmer and warmer and warmer. And then we turn into a liquid that's getting warmer and warmer and hotter and hotter. And then we turn into a gas that is heating up at the very end as well. So on these upward sloped kind of areas, these upward angled parts of the heating curve, we are a certain state of matter that is warming up, getting hotter and hotter. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm getting over some really nasty allergy stuff that I had all weekend. So it's mostly gone by now, but still got kind of the very tail end of it left. All right, so that's kind of part one of our heating curves, talking about these areas where the temperature is going up. But what about these parts? Why is it that even though we're sitting on like a hot plate or a stove, why are these parts staying at the same temperature? And that has to do with something else, some other type of energy, and it's called potential energy. So kinetic energy is the one we were just talking about it where the particles move faster and it causes the temperature to go up. Potential energy also relates to our particles, but instead of being how fast they move, potential energy is related to how close that they are together, how tightly packed in that they are. So the more spread out that you are, the more space you have, the more potential energy that you have. So as space goes up, potential energy goes up too. So potential energy, our particle space at our matter, changes when the matter changes phase. So when we're going through things like melting or boiling or freezing or condensing, that's when we're going from either close together particles that are more spread out or spread out particles that are getting closer together. So the reason why these areas are flat on the curve, they're not going up or down, is because while this change is going on, while this phase change is happening, the particles are not speeding up or slowing down. They're moving the same amount. They're just being forced to be either more spread apart or more close together. So during these changes, the kinetic energy and the temperature are staying the same. They're not changing. The heat isn't changing the temperature. Instead, it is changing if the matter is a solid versus a liquid or a liquid versus a gas. So that's what this potential energy or PE 
is related to. It gets increased when we spread our particles apart, when we get more space in our matter. And we do that by going through one of those phase changes that we were just talking about. So if we go back to our heating curve, you may remember there are two areas on there where we were flat. We have this melting area down here and this vaporizing or boiling area up here. So in this case, this is a heating curve for water, like I said. And in Celsius, the melting point of water is zero degrees Celsius. So we were that super cold solid, but then we hit the melting point. And now instead of heating up, we are melting and changing into a liquid. So since we're going from super tight together particles to a little bit spread out particles, that's why our potential energy is going up. So for a little while, the temperature stays the same because we are changing from solid over here to liquid over here. Once all of that solid turns into liquid, then we can start heating up and heating up and heating up and heating up. And then, boom, we hit another temperature point. In this case, since we're dealing with water, we've reached the boiling point of water, which is 100 degrees Celsius. So while the water is boiling, it is going to stay at 100 degrees Celsius. It's not going to get much higher or much lower. So you can have a pot of water sitting on the stove for 20 minutes boiling away. And when you first check the temperature and when you check the temperature after 20 minutes, it's still gonna be right around 100 degrees Celsius. So we're boiling the water, boiling the water. It takes a really long time to boil all the water away. But eventually we've phase changed all that water into gas. So we started off as a liquid, boiled and boiled, phase changed away, and now everything is a gas that then is able to start heating up once again. So we have these flat points on our heating curve, these flat areas, because that's where the phase change is happening. That's where we're either going from solid to liquid or from liquid to gas. And while we're phase changing, we are not changing the temperature. The temperature only changes when we have fully changed into a liquid or into a gas or when we started off as a solid. So while we're set as one type of matter, the temperature goes up. When we're changing from one matter to the other, the temperature stays flat, stays the same. So if we put it all together, we'd get something that looks kind of like this. We start off with a solid piece of ice that's very, very cold. And we put that on a stove, we stick a thermometer into it. And when it's first starting to heat up, that solid ice is getting warmer and warmer until eventually we hit zero degrees Celsius. And at zero degrees Celsius, that solid ice starts to melt. So while the ice is melting, the temperature stays the same. It stays right around zero degrees. And so we melt the solid, we melt, we melt, we melt. And eventually all of that solid ice has melted into liquid water. Now that we're not changing phase anymore, our temperature starts to go up. So we're getting warmer and warmer and hotter and hotter and hotter liquid until eventually, boom, we hit the boiling point for liquid, which in the case of water is 100 degrees Celsius. So now, once we hit 100 degrees, this liquid water starts to phase change into gas. And while we're doing that, while we're vaporizing the water, again, 
no temperature change happens. We're staying at the same temperature of 100 degrees for a long, long time until all that liquid gets boiled away. It gets turned all into gas. Once all the liquid is gone and only water vapor gas is left over, the gas is able to start heating up once again and increasing in temperature. So that's what a heating curve shows us for any type of matter that we do this type of heating with. We start off with a very cold solid. It heats up. When it starts to melt, the temperature will stay the same while the melting is going on. Once everything's liquid, it starts to heat up again. Once we hit that boiling point, we'll stay at that boiling point until all the liquid is gone, in which case the gas that's left over will start to heat up itself. So we're going through these phases of staying as one phase, but the temperature is increasing, or changing between phases, but the temperature is staying the same. It's not changing. That's what either these upward lines or these flat lines on our heating curve are telling us. Our areas where we are heating up as a phase of matter or areas where we are changing from one phase to another. If we put this all together all the way from a cold solid up to a hot gas, that will tell us our heating curve. So in the case of water, we have these phase changes at zero degrees Celsius and at 100 degrees Celsius. All right. I know there are a whole bunch of different parts of this heating curve that I just threw at you, um, but does anybody have any questions, anything about the heating curve that you're still a little bit not sure about or a little bit confused about. Now is the time to ask. Yeah, I have a question. Um, why is it that the temperature doesn't change whenever it's like melting or boiling? So the temperature doesn't change because essentially the energy that we're getting from like the stove, for example, instead of making the particles move faster and faster, which gives us the increased temperature, it's making the particles move farther apart. So essentially it's breaking the bonds that hold those solid particles really close together and forcing them to spread apart, which is what turns it into a liquid. Or up here, the energy is forcing the liquid particles to move even further apart and turning it into a gas. So because we have all this energy going into breaking the particles apart from one another, none of the energy is going into making the particles faster or heating them up. And that's what gives us these flat areas. Because instead of increasing the movement of the particles and their kinetic energy, we are increasing the space between the particles. And since we're not increasing the movement of the particles anymore, we don't see any temperature increase while this phase change stuff is going on. Okay, yeah, that makes, that makes sense. <laughs> All right, awesome. It's essentially kind of like the energy coming off as heat from your stove, from either the fire or the electrical burner that you have under there, it can either do one of two things. It can make your particles faster or it can make them move farther apart, but it can't do both at the same time. So while your particles are getting faster, they're still staying about the same distance from each other. While your particles are moving farther apart, they can't be moving any faster. So the energy is either going to one thing or the other. If they're moving farther apart, then the temperature is not going to go up. But if they're moving faster, then the temperature 
will go up. All right, good question, good, good question. Any other questions? Anything else on the heating curve that you're still a little bit not sure about? I'm okay. All right, cool, cool, thank you, thank you. All right, so I'll do one more overview of the heating curve before jumping into the homework, just to kind of really make sure everybody's got it in their head. So we start off, in this case, we're dealing with water. So we start off with a big, very frozen, very solid piece of ice. We put it on our stove and we start to warm it up. So at first, the ice particles are just moving faster and faster, which is what causes the temperature of the ice to go up. And then we hit zero degrees Celsius, our melting point. Now the ice starts to melt. And while the ice is melting, the temperature stays the same. So we're starting as a solid and we're keeping the temperature the same, but we are changing from a solid into a liquid. So after all the solid has melted, the heat from our heating source will start to heat up that liquid. That'll get hotter and hotter and hotter in our pot until we hit the boiling point of water, which is 100 degrees Celsius. Once the water starts boiling, now we're changing from a liquid into a gas. While that change is going on, we have no change in temperature. So we're changing phase, not temperature in this second part. We start off as a liquid, but we're changing into gas, changing into gas, boiling and vaporizing away until eventually all of that liquid has changed into gas, at which point we're no longer going through the boiling phase change. So the gas at the end will start to be able to heat up as well. So that is our heating curve. That's the curve that will be produced for basically any substance if you take it from a solid to a liquid to a gas. So the homework for today is pretty simple. The one for tomorrow is a teeny bit more challenging, uh, but I'll give you guys a quick preview of both. So a couple of people have already done today's homework. Um, if you've done it already, but after the notes today, you wanna go back and change some of your answers, that is totally fine and okay. I'm good with that. So there are kind of two major parts to today's homework. There's a first part which has, well, there's like a little introduction just kind of reminding you about solids, liquids, and gases. Uh, there's also something called plasma, but we didn't really talk about plasma. Don't worry about that one. So we have our three diagrams right here. And the first thing I want you to do is tell me with the left diagram or the center diagram, or the right diagram, which one is a gas, which one best represents a liquid, and which one best represents a solid. So we have very close together particles, kind of medium spread out particles, and very spread out particles up here. And um, I have a question about those. Yes. Um, the last one, I think liquid, this one. So the last one oh, is no. meant to kind of represent particles very spread out from each other, very far apart from each other. So I can't tell you exactly which one is which since that's part of I'm, I'm, I'm ready, I finish uh, this work. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Um, again, if after the notes today, you wanna go back and like redo uh -huh. it, some of you, that is okay. But so again, so our first kind of diagram here, very close, tight together particles. Our middle diagram, a little bit more spread out, a little bit more apart. And then our right diagram, very far spread apart, very far spread out. Ah, uh, it's okay. 
So you're going to label these, the left diagram, the middle, and the right as either a solid, liquid, or a gas. And then the second part down here, we have our little kind of phase change triangle where I've labeled each one of these arrows showing us going from gas to solid or from solid to liquid or from gas to liquid or liquid to gas or whichever direction that you might need. There's a little kind of reminder cheat sheet up here about which one represents which. And so all I want you to do is label each one of these arrows. So we have arrow one is, whoops, arrow one is this guy, arrow two is this guy, arrow three is this guy, and so on and so forth. So pretty straightforward homework for today. And then the homework for tomorrow, your daily assignment for tomorrow has to do with that heating curve that we were just looking at. So this will be posted tomorrow morning. You'll have all day tomorrow to work on it. But we have a very similar heating curve right here to the one that we were looking at earlier in the notes. This one has some different points labeled on it from A to F. And it mentions that this is an ice cube. So just like the one that we were looking at earlier, this is also a heating curve for water. The reason that I bring that up is because there are a couple questions that are essentially talking about what's going on at A, what's going on between A and B, and between B and C, and stuff like that. And then there's also a couple questions asking about measuring the temperature. So again, this is an ice cube, so it's water, either solid water, liquid water, or gas water. And so the temperature for the phase changes is going to be the exact same temperature as the heating curve that we were just looking at in the notes. But again, it has questions like essentially what's happening between A and B, what's going on between B and C, what's happening what state of matter is the water in between C and D? What's going on between D and E? And then when we reach E and F, our final points, what state are we in there? And so definitely take your time, go through the heating curve from the notes. If you need to, you can go back and rewatch this video if you want me to hear me go through the heating curve again. Um, but all of it's set up a little bit differently. It's not the exact same shape, but it has the exact same parts that we were just looking at with our heating curve in the notes. So that is what will be the homework for tomorrow, uh, Wednesday. All right, any questions about either of the homeworks? The different states of matter or the heating curve homeworks. Yeah, um, on the Google Classroom, um, it says the two, like the, um, hold on, let me try to find it, the, the states of matter one and then the notes two heating curve, we, uh, it doesn't have like any work attached to it, right? Um, it, should. Oh, yeah, because mine's for those two. It's, it's just like the slideshow thing. There isn't like any like PDF or anything. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So for the anyone that says notes on it, so like Tuesday notes two or Tuesday notes one, yeah. it's just the slideshow of the notes on it. Oh, OK. Yeah, I was, I was just wondering. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So only the ones labeled as assignment will have like those worksheets that we were just looking at. Oh, OK. Okay. Yep, yep. Good question. So yeah, so that way, if you ever want to go back and look at just the notes from a class, you can find it really easily. Or if you're just looking to get the homework done, you can find that easily as well. And then, uh, so the only thing we need to do today is the assignment state of matter thing, right? Yep. Yeah, the 413 Tuesday and assignment then... matter. That's today's homework. And then the only thing you need to do tomorrow is that heating curve homework. 
Oh, okay. And then that's going to show up at 12, right? Yep. Yeah, that'll show up at midnight tomorrow morning. All right. All right, yeah, those are my only questions. Thank you. No worries. All right, any other questions about the homework, states of matter, heating curves, anything that I've talked about so far today?